Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 75, Pregnancy, Abortion, and Divorce. Today's episode is brought to you by our new April Patreon supporters, James Hanks, Jose Luis Fernandez Blanco, and MJ, as well as PayPal donor Richard McNellis. Once again, I do apologize if I didn't pronounce those correctly, but I do thank you for your donations and support of the podcast. If you too would like to support the history of ancient Greece, you can become a monthly Patreon supporter at www.patreon.com backslash the history of ancient Greece podcast dot com or a one time donor at www.paypal.me backslash Ryan Stitt. Links to the various sites are in the show notes. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. On the last episode, we discussed the legal status of women in ancient Athens, including the dowry and the epikleros, the betrothal and marriage rituals, and the ideal of separation and seclusion for women, both the evidence for and against it. This separation was necessary because women were seen to be ideally suited for the domestic sphere, and thus were excluded from participating in the political sphere. To begin this episode, we will discuss the major role that women had in public service, that being the production of boys who would go on to become adult male citizens, as well as the various ways that a couple could get rid of unwanted children, typically females, and divorce in ancient Athens, which oftentimes occurred because of childlessness or adultery, two topics which also will be discussed in this episode. In later times, childbirth aroused considerable interest in medical circles. The most famous work is the gynecology, a word which literally comes from the Greek words gyne, or a woman, and logos, or word, thought, or reason, so that it means the study of women. It was a treatise written by a physician named Serranos in the 2nd century AD. He was a Greek from Ephesus in Asia Minor who practiced in both Alexandria and Rome, and he included in his work a highly detailed account of the practices surrounding labor, childbirth, and nursing, including all aspects of the female reproductive system that were not only abnormal, but especially what was normal, which is important because ancient medical writers tended to only focus on abnormalities when it came to women. But this came much later, as we mentioned, and so we have to be careful with thinking that Roman imperial medical philosophies and views were the same as classical Greek. A large part of our information about the physical side of women's lives in the classical period, though, is derived from a collection of writings known as the Hippocratic Corpus. These are medical treatises by a variety of anonymous authors, most of whom were probably writing in the late 5th and 4th centuries BC. In antiquity, most of these works were attributed to the great 5th century BC doctor, Hippocrates, but nowadays it is doubted whether any of them in fact were written by Hippocrates himself. Regardless, we will discuss Hippocrates and his lasting legacy in further detail in a future episode. But since eight of the works in the corpus are devoted to the subject of women, it seems clear that females formed a significant part of the clientele of Hippocratic doctors. As one might expect, the professional treatment of women's illnesses in the classical period was handled very largely by men. Although there is some evidence to show that there were at least a few women doctors in 4th century BC Athens, these were probably fairly rare. However, childbirth was the one medical situation in which a woman might expect it to be attended solely by other women, those being the midwives. However, male doctors were called in if there were any complications. Furthermore, male doctors were often assisted by female attendants, who might have been used for manual medical tasks, and in some cases, when an external examination was needed to be carried out on the female patient, the doctor sometimes relied on them, and they would report the results back to him. There was no stipulation saying that this had to occur, though, and so the male doctor could have performed the examination himself on a female patient as well. Still, though, few records exist of the normal procedures and reactions of the female functions of menstruation, nursing, menopause, and so forth that were dealt with by other women in the form of midwives and wet nurses. As a rule of thumb, throughout antiquity, with very few exceptions, the doctors, including those writing in the Hippocratic Corpus, who took care of females were not only male, but as we mentioned, they typically only concerned themselves with the diseases and irregularities. 
Among the Hippocratic corpus, there is no treatise on the diseases of men to match those assigned to women. Although Hippocratic doctors seem to have treated their female patients no less scrupulously than the males, their writings do indicate that they viewed women as a special case, as a deviation from the masculine norm. This should serve to forewarn us, then, that there is an element in the medical treatises which derives from an ideological view of the physical nature of women. In particular, in the discussions of women's reproductive systems, ideas about women's physiology can be seen to reflect and reinforce masculine ideas about female social and moral identity. Another large source from the classical period on women is Aristotle, and his views on women by far influenced later Christian and Islamic thinkers, who quoted him as an authority on the matter until the end of the 16th century, and are thus an important topic in women's history. He believed that women were inferior to men, and as such ought to be subjected to them. Aristotle went so far as to put forward the notion of a zoological hierarchy with men at the pinnacle and with women being one giant evolutionary step below, though at least they are higher in the pecking order than slaves, for whatever that is worth. And so for Aristotle, women presented the first step along the evolutionary road to deformity. In his politics, Aristotle says, quote, The courage of a man lies in commanding, a woman's lies in obeying. End quote. Aristotle explains how and why the association between man and women takes on hierarchical character by commentating on the masculine rule over barbarians, or non-Greeks, saying, quote, By nature, the female has been distinguished from the slave, for nature makes nothing in the manner that the coppersmiths make the Delphic knife, that is frugally, but rather it makes each thing for one purpose— for each thing would do its work most nobly if it had one task rather than many. Among the barbarians, the female and the slave have the same status. This is because there are no natural rulers among them, but rather the association among them is between male and female slave. On account of this, the poets say that it is fitting that the Greeks rule barbarians, as the barbarian and the slave are by nature the same." End quote. Aristotle believed that men and women naturally differed both physically and mentally, as a female is an incomplete male, or as it were, a deformity, as we just mentioned. While Aristotle reduced women's role in society, and even promoted the idea that women should receive less food and nourishment than males, he also paradoxically criticized the results. He claimed that women are, quote, more mischievous, more opinionated, more impulsive, more compassionate, more easily moved to tears, more jealous, more curious, more apt to scold and to strike, more prone to despondency and less hopeful, more void of shame or self-respect, more false of speech, more deceptive and of having a better memory, end quote. He said all of this as part of his argument that there should be political rule of the husband over the wife. As for the differences between husband and wife, Aristotle says that these always consisted in external appearances, in speeches and in honors. The household functions of a man and of a woman are different because his business is to get and hers is to keep. At the same time, though, Aristotle gave equal weight to women's happiness as he did to men's. And he commented in his treatise, titled Rhetoric, that a society cannot be happy unless women are happy too. This is because Aristotle believed that in nature, a common good came of the rule of a superior being. But he does not indicate a common good for men being superior to women. He uses the word kriton to indicate superiority, meaning stronger. Aristotle believed that rational reasoning is what made you superior over lesser beings in nature, yet still use the term meaning stronger, not more rational or intelligent. In his treatise titled Oikonomicus, Aristotle wrote that it befits not a man of sound mind to bestow his person promiscuously or have random intercourse with women, for otherwise the base-born will share in the rights of his lawful children, and his wife will be robbed of the honor due to her, and shame will be attached to his sons. It is fitting that a man should approach his wife in honor, full of self-restraint and awe, and in his conversation with her, he should use only the words of a right-minded man suggesting only such acts as these are themselves lawful and honorable. Aristotle thought that a wife was best honored when she saw that her husband was faithful to her, and that he had no preference for another woman, but before all other lovers, trusts her and holds her as his own. 
Aristotle wrote that a husband should secure the agreement, loyalty, and devotion of his wife, so that whether he himself is present or not, there may be no difference in her attitude towards him, since she realizes that they are alike guardians of their common interests. And so when he is away, she may feel that to her no man is kinder or more virtuous or more truly hers than her own husband. On the topic of children, Aristotle said, quote, And what could be more divine than this, or more desired by a man of sound mind, than to beget by a noble and honored wife children who shall be the most loyal supporters and discreet guardians of their parents in old age, and the preservers of the whole house? Rightly reared by father and mother, children will grow up virtuous, and those who have treated them piously and righteously deserve that they should." End quote. Aristotle believed that we all have a biological drive to procreate in order to leave behind something to take our place and be similar to ourselves. This then justifies the natural partnership in his mind between a man and a woman. And each person has one specific purpose because we are better at mastering one specific trait rather than being adequate at multiple. For Aristotle, a woman's purpose is to give birth to children. Aristotle stressed that men and women work together to raise the children and that how they raise them has a huge influence over the kind of people that they become and thus the kind of society or community that everyone lives in. As we discussed last episode, young girls were married off quite frequently as soon as they reached puberty so as to get an early jump on her childbearing years. According to Aristotle in his History of Animals, a girl's breasts start to swell and they begin to menstruate after she has reached the age of 13. Some of the Hippocratic writers see the onset of puberty as a time when young women are particularly vulnerable. For example, the author of the Hippocratic Treatise titled On Virgins advises that girls at the Menarch are liable to suffer from hallucinations because the mouth of the womb is not yet opened up from sexual intercourse and therefore all the blood cannot flow out and it instead rushes up to the heart and lungs and they become feverish and sometimes suicidally insane to the point that they have visions which encourage them to throw themselves down from wells and drown themselves. Naturally, then, the author says that when virgins have this trouble, they should marry as soon as possible, and if they become pregnant, then they will be cured. We know that during their periods, women wore wool and rags, but little is written about the act of menstruation itself because the medical text's chief concern is the way in which menstruation affects reproduction. For example, if a woman is healthy and able to bear children, her blood will flow, quote, like that from a sacrificial animal, end quote. The treatise, called On the Diseases of Women, gives a physiological explanation of menstruation. According to the author, a woman's flesh is softer and more sponge-like than a man's. Consequently, she absorbs more moisture and becomes overfilled with blood, which thus needs to find an exit. Men, on the other hand, since they work harder than women, the physical labor draws off excessive fluid. In this analysis, the female constitution is seen as inferior to that of a male, and menstruation is believed to be intended to supply a necessary corrective to its inherent defects. In many societies, menstrual blood is regarded as a source of pollution, but this was apparently not the case with the ancient Greeks, as there is no evidence to indicate that menstruating women were prohibited from entering any religious sanctuaries whatsoever. However, Aristotle in his treatise titled On Dreams does report that if a menstruating woman looks into a clean mirror, its surface will become tarnished because the surrounding air is disturbed in some way by her eyes. So apparently, to Aristotle at least, menstruating women had some sort of magical powers, but there's no suggestion that a woman in this powerful condition possesses any kind of a threat to the men whom she encounters. Similarly, there appears to have been no taboo on sexual intercourse during menstruation. However, Aristotle in his treatise called The Generation of Animals informs that a woman will not conceive if she had sex while she is menstruating, and that the best time for conception is actually immediately after the period has finished. From Aristotle's perspective, women are failed males, as we have mentioned. It is their lack of heat that makes them more or less formless. Similarly, Galen, writing over a half millennium later, stated that if it were not for the fact that the menses were needed to contain the hot male seed, we might suppose that, quote, the creator had purposely made one half of the whole race imperfect and, as it were, mutilated, end quote. 
The fact that women needed to menstruate was proof in Aristotle's eyes that they could not burn up the residue that coagulated inside of them. They were judged to be particularly susceptible to what we would call today hysteria, a word that is derived from hystera, the Greek word for womb, meaning literally the lower parts, though its symptoms were rather different from those of the condition we identify by this name today. The Hippocratic school believed that the womb took to wandering around the body if the menses were suppressed or if the women did not engage in intercourse. So the theory supported the argument that women's sanity depended upon sexual intercourse. As we have mentioned, the overriding duty of any Greek wife, not just Athenian, was to provide her husband with offspring, preferably boys, to ensure that his household did not die out. In addition to the pressure to conceive that came from the husband and the husband's family, there would also have been pressure from society at large, because every Greek community expected its citizens to beget legitimate children in order to keep the population at par. Because of the high level of infant mortality in the ancient world, it is estimated that each married couple would have had to produce four or five children just to achieve this modest target. The obligation to become pregnant was reinforced by medical theory, which taught that abstinence from sex was harmful to a woman's health. The Hippocratic author of the treatise entitled On the Seed states, quote, Women who have intercourse are healthier than those who abstain. For the womb is moistened by intercourse, whereas when it is drier than it should be, it becomes extremely contracted, and this extreme contraction causes pain to the body, end quote. So as we can see, according to this view, men, with their penis, have a therapeutic effect on women. The most bizarre phenomenon associated with celibacy in a woman, and arguably the most famous, is known as the wandering womb. A graphic description of its cause is described by Plato in his dialogue titled Timaeus, named after the Pythagorean philosopher. By comparing human genitalia to undomesticated animals, Plato provides an etiology for sexual desire and for female hysteria, and in particular, tells us that the womb is an animal within a woman which is desirous of bearing children. If this desire remains unsatisfied for a long time, the womb becomes restless and starts to wander about the body. As a consequence, the passages for breath become blocked and the woman starts to suffer disorders of all kinds. The problems will continue until the woman has sex with a man and becomes pregnant. The Hippocratic writers in the treatise on the diseases of women provide a more mechanical explanation of the same phenomenon by describing the various ailments that might occur depending on the location of the womb. They write that if a woman doesn't have intercourse, her womb becomes dry and is liable to be displaced. It may move towards the bladder which would cause strangery, a condition of the blockage of the bladder, towards the head, which would cause suffocation, sleepiness, and foaming, at the mouth, or towards the upper abdomen, which brings on drowsiness and loss of voice. Although sexual intercourse, and more specifically pregnancy, is ultimately the cure for these ailments when they occur, the Hippocratic authors do recommend a variety of interim treatments, in case those aren't available, involving fumigations, pessaries, potions, and hot and cold baths. For example, a womb that is lodged in the abdomen should be treated with a pessary dipped in Egyptian perfume, myrtle, or marjoram, and the insertion of a feather into the nostrils to induce sneezing and inhalations of vapor are also suggested. In the case where the tomb has moved towards the liver, a doctor is advised to push the womb down with his hands and then to tie a bandage below the ribs to stop it from rising up again, like a tourniquet. While this notion of a moving womb may be quite curious to us, it may actually just have been their misunderstanding of an actual medical condition known as uterine prolapse, in which the uterus sags or slips from its normal position into the vagina or the birth canal because the muscles or ligaments that support the uterus have stretched too thin or have become too weak for whatever reason. However, nothing can explain the other routes the ancient authors explained that the womb supposedly took. It could simply have been an idea not confined to medical treatises, and just another example in Greek thought suggestive of the basic physiological instability to which a woman inevitably falls victim unless a man intervenes in her life. This belief continued into the Roman period among such physicians as Galen and Aratius. However, unlike most of his colleagues, 
Seranus did not believe in the theory of the wandering womb, and he prescribes instead reassuring attention and physical therapy with soothing medications. The Hippocratic writers were also woefully ignorant about the nature of a woman's orgasm. In the treatise, On the Seed, we are informed that once intercourse has begun, a woman experiences pleasure throughout the whole time until the man ejaculates. This is because the sperm, when it arrives in the womb, extinguishes her heat, and it's at that point when the woman's pleasure reaches her climax. And so, women's sexual gratification clearly has a supposed link with reproduction. The writer does admit, though, that conception is likely to occur if the woman experiences desire. Aristotle and his generation of animals, on the other hand, says that women can conceive without feeling pleasure and can feel pleasure without conceiving. Greek men did at least recognize that sex might be a source of mutual enjoyment to both male and female. Sometimes, though, masculine awareness of the pleasure which women derive from sex can be construed as a comment on female lust and a lack of self-control. Perhaps no example of this is more well-known than the female characters created by the comic playwright Aristophanes in his Lysistrata. When the protagonist reveals her grand design to bring war to an end by involving a sex strike on the part of the women, she's at first greeted with a horrified refusal by the chorus of women, quote, Anything, anything you want. If I had to, I'd walk through fire. Anything rather than give up penises. Lysistrata, dear, there's nothing like them. End quote. This notion of women's capacity for sexual gratification was also enshrined in myth. When Zeus and Hera were having an argument about whether men or women derived the greater pleasure from sex, they referred the matter to the prophet Tiresias, who had spent seven years of his life as a woman and was therefore in a good position to know. He informed them that if sexual pleasure were divided into ten parts, only one part would go to the man and nine parts to the woman. This rather extreme assessment of each sex's orgasms, though, are contradicted by the Hippocratic writers, who in the treatise On the Seed tells us that a man's orgasm is briefer than a woman's, as we previously mentioned, but is more intense. Aristotle wrote extensively on his views of the nature of semen and his generation of animals. In doing so, he continued upon an idea that may have been a popular one at the time. The belief that was espoused by Apollo in his famous speech in defense of Orestes and Aeschylus' Eumenides, concerning the respective contributions of male and female in the production of children. The main difference, though, is that whereas Apollo argued that women were essentially incubators, Aristotle concluded that the female contributes not only space, but also matter to the developing embryo. This matter, though, is seen as entirely passive, and thus it is the male who supplies the principle of movement and life. Generation occurs when the active ingredient, that being semen, comes into contact with menstrual blood and gives form to this inert, raw material. In this way, he asserts that a child can be said to come from both mother and father only in the sense that a bed can be said to come into being from both the wood and the carpenter. And so, his idea of procreation was an active and solely masculine element, bringing life to a passive female element, providing a nutritive value. Aristotle also wrote that only fair-skinned women, not darker-skinned women, had a sexual discharge and climaxed, and believed that this discharge could be increased by the eating of pungent foods. Aristotle also thought that a woman's sexual discharge was akin to that of an infertile or amputated males, which is essentially the idea that best encapsulated his belief in the inferiority of the female. Essentially, from Aristotle's perspective, women are failed males. He argues that she is a female on account of a kind of inadequacy, and that menstrual blood is more plentiful than semen less pure and concentrated, and thus is incapable in itself of activating generation. And so, as he puts it, women are constitutionally retarded, and for this reason, they cannot produce semen, and since they can't produce semen, they cannot have an active role in generation. However, several of the Hippocratic writers taught that both the mother and the father contributed seed to the embryo, so this was by no means the consensus medical theory. In the treatise, On the Nature of the Child, the author tells us that the seed produced by both partners mixes together in the womb and then condenses because of the pumping of the heart. Another author, in the treatise titled On the Seed, writes that the child will bear a closer resemblance to the parent 
which it draws more seed from, and that it will never be all from one and none from the other. And so, on the basis of the available evidence, Aristotle and the rest of those who discounted a woman's role in reproduction appear to have been in the minority. Pregnancy, naturally, was seen by ancient writers as a delicate and difficult condition. According to Aristotle, in his History of Animals, pregnant women began to suffer from sickness and headaches immediately after conception, and they are also subject to rapid changes of mood and to cravings, which are particularly acute if the child that is being carried is a girl. The Hippocratic Treatise on the Diseases of Women says that women are most likely to miscarry during the first three months of pregnancy, and it could occur because a woman picks up anything that is heavy, is beaten, engages in violent exercise, eats too much or too little, drinks an excessive amount, or suffers from fright. In order to enhance the health of the unborn child, Plato in his Laws recommends that women should take part in prenatal gymnastics, while Aristotle in his Politics advises for them to eat well and to get plenty of exercise, though both advise that it shouldn't be too rigorous. Mental exertion, though, was to be avoided. And Aristotle, in his History of Animals, says that sexual intercourse during pregnancy, and especially right before one is due, will deliver more quickly. When it was time to give birth, that too was extremely hazardous. Partly because the standards of hygiene were deplorably low in the ancient world, and partly because women were married off shortly after the onset of puberty, and so a large proportion of them most likely became pregnant for the first time while still in their mid-teens. For this reason, miscarriages and rough labors were extremely common, and the death of the mother also was a large risk. Although the rate of death in childbirth for ancient Greece is unknown, estimates for ancient societies in general are in the range of 10 to 20 percent. Aristotle certainly recognized the dangers of women having children so young, stating in his politics that intercourse at too young of an age was liable to produce defective children and that very young women were prone to more difficult labors and death during childbirth. If this awareness was shared by others, it did not, in Athens at least, give rise to any change in social practice. The average life expectancy of Greek women is impossible to estimate, as the age at which people died is rarely recorded on Greek tombstones, unlike we do today, and the evidence for this in the literature is non-existent. But on the basis of the study of skeletons from classical Athens, it has been calculated that the median age at death was 35 for women and 45 for men. Aristotle in his treatise titled On the Length and Shortness of Life states that men naturally live longer than women because they have more heat in their bodies. Take that for what it's worth, but it seems more likely to me that the low life expectancy of women compared to men had a lot to do with the hazards of early pregnancies. Although we hear of a variety of contraceptives, more on that shortly, there was no safe and reliable method of birth control. This meant that for many married women, there would be little respite between pregnancies. Given the importance of producing offspring, it is hardly surprising that concern about fertility and pregnancy features prominently among the Hippocratic texts, as well as the miraculous cures that are inscribed on stones in the healing sanctuary of the medicine god Asclepius at Epidaros in the northeastern Peloponnese. The failure to become pregnant was either regarded with grave suspicion or interpreted as a biological problem from which the woman was suffering. And so the Hippocratic writers record a number of tests that can be carried out in order to ascertain whether or not a woman is fertile. For example, in the treatise titled Aphorisms, the recommended method is to wrap the woman up in a cloak and to burn incense beneath her. If the smell seems to pass right through her body and can be detected in her mouth and nose, then she is capable of conceiving, but otherwise she is not. This test relies on the prevalent notion as we alluded to in regards to the therapeutic effects of sexual intercourse, that the ideal woman is an empty vessel, unobstructed and available for occupation, first by a man's penis and then by a child. In another treatise, titled On the Diseases of Women, a dozen different causes of sterility in women are discussed, all of which involve some form of internal impediment. It was believed that normal conditions could be restored by the insertion into the vagina of medicinal pessaries or fumigations, intended to expel accumulated blood or other fluids and or to restore a displaced uterus to its proper position. 
Treatments usually have the aim of softening and opening up the mouth of the womb by using a variety of substances and ointments in combination with one another after having left set for a certain number of days. Examples include crushed laurel leaves, myrrh, wormwood, beeswax, sulfur, garlic, goat fat, cyclamen juice, fig tree, cardamom seed, the marrow of oxen, goose fat, rose oil, fapsia root, leek juice, and white wine, among others. Of course, the ancient Greeks were completely ignorant of the existence of the ovaries until the 3rd century BC. Not surprisingly then, given their prejudices and the state of their medical knowledge, the Greeks also had no concept of male infertility, as they couldn't even fathom the possibility of any imperfections in the masculine counterpart. Everything was the female's fault after all. Some women resorted to more mystical methods to aid their efforts in conceiving. Although various deities might have been sought out, one of the more popular ones was Asclepius, the god of medicine, whose sanctuary at Epidaurus supposedly specialized in dream cures, where supplicants slept in dormitories on the site and had dreams which restored them to health. There will be much more on this in a future episode. Anyways, cures for sterility are mentioned quite often in inscriptions there. One such memorial records the experience of Andromache from Epirus, who dreamt that a young boy undressed her and that the goddess Sclepius touched her with his hand. She later gave birth to a son. Other dreams featured sacred snakes that were kept in the sanctuary, emphasizing their phallic significance. One such inscription, for example, states, quote, Agamede from Chios slept in the sanctuary in order to have children and saw a dream. A snake seemed to lie on her belly, and as a result, five children were born. End quote. If all else failed, then a desperate woman might have had to search the black market for a baby, at least if Aristophanes is to be believed. In his Thesmophoria Zuzai, a woman had to keep up a sham labor for ten days while her midwife was out looking for a suitable child. Eventually, a baby was brought home concealed in a jar, the husband was hurried out of the room. The beeswax, which had been used to plug the baby's mouth, was removed. The baby cried, and everyone was delighted. Of course, Aristophanes is a comedic writer, and as such, it isn't the most reliable of sources sometimes. But in classical Athens, with the pressure to produce children as high as it was, it seems more than likely that deals such as this one could have in fact occurred. However, once a woman had provided her husband with a male heir, her standing and respect within the household increased considerably. In a speech written by Lysias, an Athenian husband who discovered his wife in bed with her lover and stabbed the man to death in his anger, justifies his action by stating that after the arrival of his firstborn, he had bestowed upon his wife complete control of his estate and the erroneous belief that the two of them had now achieved a condition of complete intimacy. Despite the keen desire for children, many Athenian families did not want or desire large families because inheritance was divided equally among the surviving sons. So having too many sons would have been undesirable since the estate would have had to be divided among them. For daughters, fathers were required to pay a substantial dowry to attract for them a suitable husband. Also, the sexual neglect of wives, oftentimes in favor of slaves, concubines, or prostitutes, Infant and child mortality, and what we would consider homosexual activities, may also have had some effect in the limitation of family sizes. The extent, though, to which contraception was also responsible is very debatable. Aside from anal intercourse, there seems to have been very few contraceptive techniques, or the initiative rested with the male. There is no evidence for the use of anything resembling a condom in ancient Greece, and there is only one reference, that being in Archilochus' seduction poem, to what could be called coitus interruptus, or the so-called pull-out technique. The most detailed account of contraception is provided by Serranus, but none of the methods which he discusses seem to have been very effective, through modern lenses, and it is impossible to know to what extent they were used. The objective in most of them is either to block the womb or to cause it to contract. Included are the digestion of herbal potions and concoctions of vinegar and water, the insertion into the vagina of pads of wool smeared with various substances, including aged olive oil, honey, cedar resin, juice of balsam, and a paste made from myrtle oil and white lead. Another involves a plant known as tanning sumac, 
which is to be rubbed with wine and wrapped in a clump of fine wool and then stuffed in the vagina and left in for two to three hours, all in order to make the womb contract. It has to be removed just before intercourse. This was all done to change the size of the womb because ancient Greek medical writers believed that pregnancy could be prevented or miscarried by enlarging or constricting a woman's womb. Inevitably, though, despite these contraceptive techniques, some pregnancies were unwanted, and one solution was abortion. And there is no evidence to suggest that any Greek law code contained a blanket prohibition of it. Generally speaking, abortion was not condemned by the philosophers, though the Pythagoreans were the exception, as they alone believed that an embryo was imbued with life from the moment of conception. Plato, though, in his ideal state and the Republic, had no scruples about it, and Aristotle in his politics recommended it as a way of restricting population. Athens, at least, did appear to have some legal restrictions on abortion. For example, the Hippocratic Oath, which probably dates to the 4th century BC, contained a prohibition against giving any sort of drug to cause an abortion, though it is unclear whether the ban was primarily due to ethical or medical considerations. Furthermore, the oath did not ban abortion altogether, and there is a famous passage in a Hippocratic text entitled The Nature of the Child, in which a prostitute is encouraged to jump up and down while kicking her buttocks with her heels in order to expel the fetus. Abortion, though, could not be performed without the permission of the father, and it would have been extremely dangerous, particularly if surgery were employed, not least because of the risk of infections. In fact, Seranus recommended it only if a woman's life was in danger. Regardless, it seems that abortions sometimes were induced by the mothers themselves. One Hippocratic text on the diseases of women says that, quote, when a woman has damaged herself through an abortion, as many women are doing all the time, she will recover if treated properly, but will remain sterile, end quote. The same author goes on by saying that women who have abortions undergo great risks because it is impossible to abort the embryo without violence, whether by drugs, potions, food, or something else. The Greeks also had to contend with the fear of the polluting effect of an aborted fetus. A sacred law from the sanctuary of Artemis in Cyrene, for example, decreed that, quote, if a woman has a miscarriage or abortion when the fetus is fully formed, the household is polluted as if by death, meaning heavily, whereas if it is fully formed, the household is polluted as if by childbirth, meaning lightly, end quote. Aristotle, who in his politics advocated performing an abortion only before the fetus received life and feeling, seems to have been mainly concerned with the risk of increased pollution that a later abortion would cause. Medical scruples and a fear of pollution aside, it is likely that many Greek women did resort to abortion, particularly victims of rape, unmarried girls, and prostitutes. Another solution for unwanted pregnancies was ecthesis, exposure, or apothesis, abandonment. Simply killing an unwanted baby was forbidden, for the simple reason that to do so would cause pollution and involve the murder and blood guilt. But exposing a newborn baby to die was not forbidden. The unwanted infant was placed inside a clay pot, carried outside the city, probably by a slave or a midwife, and left to its fate. They were abandoned in places like the local garbage dump. Slave dealers sometimes collected a few of the exposed infants and gave them to wet nurses to be raised and later to be sold as slaves, most likely as poor and I. Most exposed infants, though, most likely died and exposure quickly became infanticide. The best illustration of this practice can be seen in the myth of Oedipus. An Athenian father might dispose of any unwanted offspring to get rid of another division in his estate, in the case of a son, or an unwanted dowry, and therefore another drain on the family's finances, in the case of a daughter. Although both boys and girls could be exposed, the traditional belief is that girls were almost certainly abandoned, more frequently than boys, and families with more than two daughters were probably somewhat rare. Although the eldest child was normally raised regardless of its sex, some estimates have put the level of female exposure in Athens as high as 20%. There is some literary support for this estimate too. In a lost drama titled Posidippus, a comic writer of the 3rd century BC puts the following observation into the mouth of one of his characters. Quote, if you have a son, you bring him up, even if you're poor. But if you have a daughter, you abandon her even if you're rich, end quote. 
Evidently, the mother's feelings were regarded as irrelevant. The lower value placed on girls is also strikingly illustrated by Herodotus's comment about the Spartan king Cleomenes, who he says, quote, died childless, leaving behind only one daughter, Gorgo, end quote. Other groups that were at risk of being exposed, including those who were the product of rape or incest, and the deformed. In fact, at Sparta, the abandonment of handicapped and sickly infants on Mount Tygetos was required by law, as we saw in episode 23. However, infertility was a serious problem in the Greek world, and many childless couples would have been only too happy to act as the foster parents of any unwanted children, and so it's likely that exposed babies were left near some sort of crossroads where there would have been a chance that someone wanting a child would have picked it up. Of course, we have no way of knowing how common it was, but it no doubt would have been another option for any unwanted pregnancies. Furthermore, given the hazards of life coupled with a low life expectancy, a very large number of children must have grown up fatherless. The primary meaning of orphanos, which gives us the word orphan. To safeguard fatherless children, and equally to encourage the fathers of young children to risk their lives in the service of the state, many Greek polis made it their policy to support orphans at public expense until they reached their 18th year. 5th century BC Athens, for example, made it so that orphans received one obol per day. Although their welfare was administered by the eponymous Archon, we also hear of Orphanophilakis, or protectors of orphans, who may have been assigned to individual orphans to perform a role similar to that of social workers today. Also, by the 4th century BC in Athens, there were three forms of adoption, either performed while a man was still alive, stipulated in his will, or if a man died without a male heir, and without providing for the adoption of a son in his will, he could have a son assigned to him to carry on his family. An adopted son was no longer a member of his original oikos, but was transferred to the oikos of his adopter. If he wished to return to his original oikos, he had to leave a son of his own in his adoptive oikos in order that it might continue. Naturally, though, not every marriage would have been a fruitful one. Although it probably was less common than the rate of 50% or so that we see today, divorce was something that could happen in ancient Athens, and it did not bear any social stigma. Although both husband and wife had the power to initiate a divorce, it was quite easy for a man to do so, and very difficult for a woman. A husband simply had to send his wife back to her father with her dowry intact, in order to end the marriage and he had the right to divorce his wife without giving any sort of justification. But as we mentioned last episode, he had to return her dowry, and if he failed to return the dowry, he faced the possibility of imprisonment. Although divorce was established by the fact of separation, rather than by any legal process, there are many legal contracts that pertain to instances of divorce, and it's interesting to note that oftentimes, the responsibility of the marital breakdown is ascribed to a daemon, or an evil spirit the ancient equivalent of irreconcilable differences. If his wife was proved to be an adulteress, he was compelled by law, in fact, to divorce her under the threat of disenfranchisement. In many cases, though, in order to avoid scandal, husbands may not have strictly followed this law if the infidelity was not discovered by the general public. Also, from the 5th century BC onwards, if he had discovered subsequent to the marriage that she had not been a citizen, he was obliged to divorce her immediately. Failure to do so would result in the loss of his citizenship rights, if it was found out that he had known. A husband was also expected to divorce a barren wife, given that the primary purpose of marriage at this time was to produce children. Aristotle, in his Nicomachean Ethics, writes, Children are a bond between parents, which is why childless marriages break up more quickly. And so it seems that the most common motive for divorce was probably childlessness. Divorces, though, were very difficult for a woman to obtain because she needed the approval of a male relative, who also had to be willing to serve as her guardian after the dissolution of her marriage. He then had to appear before the Archon Basileus as her legal representation in order to make it official. If she sought to represent herself, the law afforded her no protection from further abuse, as we see in the case of Hipparete, the wife of Alcibiades who became so distressed by her husband's whoring around that she went to live with her brother Callias. According to Plutarch, in his Life of Alcibiades, 
and when she later lodged a complaint against him in the courts. For some reason, her brother wasn't present, and Alcibiades, quote, seized hold of her and dragged her back home through the Agora, with no one daring to stop him or rescue her, end quote. Ultimately, she never got that divorce, and she lived with him until she died. A continuous habit of domestic violence from the husband was probably the only real grounds in which a woman could sue for divorce and be granted it without the husband's approval. There were two additional procedures by which people other than the couple could dissolve a marriage. The first of these was a divorce initiated by the father of the bride, but this was only permitted if the wife had not borne her husband a child. The father might have wished to do this for a more profitable match, especially if his son-in-law was not making much money. Finally, if a woman became an epicleros after her marriage, her closest male relative on her father's death was allowed to end her current marriage in order to marry her. We discussed the legality of the epicleros last episode. Regardless of how it happened, if there were children at the time of the divorce, they remained in their father's house, and he remained responsible for their upbringing. Furthermore, because of the typically large age difference between men and women at the time of their marriage, many wives became widows by the time that they reached their late 20s or early 30s. Some might even have been grandmothers already at about the same age. Young widows of childbearing age probably had a good chance of remarrying if her dowry was a substantial one. If a widow remained single and had at least one son, she would generally have remained in her late husband's oikos. But if she had no sons, she could either return to her previous oikos or stay on in her old home with her husband's designated heir. The person on whom the guardianship of her dowry had fallen, either her son, her nearest male relative, or her husband's heir, was obliged by law to support her. And so widows, like divorcees, were guaranteed some degree of economic security. It seems that one benefit for older widows who had passed menopause was that they enjoyed considerable more freedom of movement than their younger counterparts. In fact, a significant number of women workers in the roles of nurses and midwives were those who passed childbearing age. The attitude behind this relaxation of restraint is probably best explained by the 4th century BC orator Hyperides when he states that, quote, a woman who leaves the house ought to be at the stage in life where people who meet her ask, not whose wife she is, but whose mother, end quote. And so it seems that Athenian men were less concerned about the trouble that older women could find themselves in because they were past their childbearing years, and thus any of their indiscretions would not affect the lineage of legitimate citizens. According to Aristotle, in his History of Animals, most women ceased to menstruate around their 40th year, but some continued to be fertile up to about the age of 50, and pregnancies at this age, while rare, were not unknown. There is very little discussion of menopause in Greek literature, probably because far fewer women lived long enough to experience it. But the low valuation placed upon non-fertile females could also have contributed to the masculine neglect of this stage in a woman's life. The social restrictions on the freedom of movement for women serve the masculine goal of avoiding any sort of uncertainty about the paternity of children by limiting opportunities for adultery among wives and protecting the virginity of daughters. In fact, so important was it for the Athenians to be certain that a boy truly was his father's son and not the offspring of some other man who could conceivably even be a foreigner or a slave and thus would disqualify the boy for citizenship, that if there was even a hint of suspicion, women were obliged to take oaths affirming the paternities of their sons. An Athenian law on adultery, called Graphi Moikias, is known to have existed, though it has not survived. In classical Athens, the term Moikia is often translated to mean adultery, but its meaning is slightly different than the English term we typically use. That's because moikia was seen as a criminal offense and was restricted to any illicit sex with a free woman under the protection of a kyrios. And so, a man having sex with a wife, widowed mother, or unmarried sister or daughter of a free man were all considered to be instances of moikia. On the other hand, men could legally have extramarital sex with concubines, medics, slaves, and prostitutes, which modern mores would consider to fall under the definition of adultery. Furthermore, moikia was always committed by men upon women, 
This is because it was treated as a public matter, a good indication that the protection of the integrity of the oikos was considered to be in the interests of the community as a whole. Lysias claims that the Athenians considered the seduction of a citizen woman a more serious crime than even rape or sexual assault for two reasons. First, the seducer won the wife's confidence and could steal the household goods that she protected. And secondly, because a seduced woman was more likely than a raped one to pass off the adulterer's child as her husband's. If she was detected, then the parentage of all of her children would be questioned, and claims both to inheritance and to citizenship would be thrown into confusion. It goes without saying, then, that the sufferings of a raped woman were legally of no concern. Though on a personal level, if not legally, it may have been viewed with more disgust. It is impossible to know how often women were involved in illicit love affairs, but it seems unlikely that they were very common, simply because women had so few opportunities for meeting men outside the family circle. In the only detailed account of which we have of an alleged adulterous relationship, the aforementioned legal speech of Lysias, titled against Eratosthenes, the wife of the speaker, Euphiletus, was said to have met her future lover at the funeral of her mother-in-law, one of the rare occasions when a woman might encounter other men, and even then, it's not a circumstance that is particularly conducive to seduction. Eratosthenes was said to have approached the wife indirectly, using the household slave girl as a go-between. Eventually, he began to come to her house when the husband was away at his country estate. However, some of Aristophanes' characters refer to women's extramarital affairs as though they were a regular occurrence. For example, in Women in the Assembly, when extolling the traditional values of women, Praxinoa says, quote, They bake cakes, as they've always done. They annoy their husbands, as they've always done. And they hide lovers in the house, as they've always done. End quote. These illusions, though, could stem from a male paranoia about the female sexual appetite that women are wild, instinctive, and in need of male control. But they inevitably cast a doubt as to whether Athenian women in reality always maintain the rigid chastity which Athenian sexual mores sought to impose. There were at least four possible responses to adultery available to the aggrieved party. First, if the adulterer was caught in the sexual act, they could be summarily executed by the curios of the woman they were found with. This provision for justifiable homicide was supposedly made legal under the Code of Draco. However, this was probably an uncommon response, and scholars generally believe that this penalty was only rarely exacted. Other alternatives to this course of action were probably set into the law under Solon. They include the charging of the offender in a court of law, the extracting of a financial penalty, or the subjecting of the offender to physical abuse with the aim of humiliating him. The latter was probably the most common and has a precedent going back to Homer, when Hephaestus captures Ares and Aphrodite in bed together and displays them in front of the other gods to be ridiculed. Comic sources describe the abuse and humiliation of those guilty of Moikia, including a scene in the clouds where Aristophanes refers to an adulterer being punished by the insertion of a radish into his anus, a process called rathanidosis. A fish, specifically a mullet, might also have been used, a more awkward alternative because of the spines. Another comic punishment for adulterers includes the public removal of one's pubic hair by having hot ashes sprinkled over his genitals. Both of these punishments were intended to humiliate the adulterer by feminizing him, as the cutting of hair was a standard part of a female beauty regimen in classical Athens, and being penetrated was associated with femininity. While some scholars question whether these comic forms of abuse were carried out in reality, others have argued that the reason that these jokes had such longevity in comedy was precisely because they were a reflection of reality. Furthermore, a married woman who was discovered committing adultery would be divorced and prohibited from participating in all public religious activities of the state, meaning that she was cut off from the one form of public involvement that was available to her. If a woman who had committed adultery violated this and was discovered, any man who met her at a public religious rite was to tear off her clothes and physically beat her, although he must stop short of killing her. If her husband did not wish to divorce her, and it was found out by the public, he would lose his citizenship rights for disobeying the law. A husband might have risked this, though, either to keep the dowry, because it might have been so large, or to avoid scandal and shame. 
An unmarried woman caught in adultery by her curios could be sold into slavery, though there is no known instance of this penalty in fact being carried out. Xenophon claims that the right to kill a moikis was enshrined in law not just in Athens, but throughout the cities of Greece. However, the adultery laws which we know of through other sources from elsewhere in Greece tend to enforce either a financial penalty or abuse and humiliation, rather than death as a punishment. At Gorton, for example, the penalty for moikia was a fine of up to 200 staters. The law for adultery at Gorton also stipulated that unless payment was made within five days, the Kyrgios could abuse the adulterer however he wished, paralleling the abuse of adulterers permitted in Athens. In various other Greek cities, we have stories of adulterers being publicly humiliated as a form of punishment. According to Plutarch, adulterous women in Chime were publicly addressed as donkey riders. Aristotle says that in Leprion, in the Peloponnese, Male adulterers were bound and led around the city for three days, while adulteresses were made to stand in the agora in a transparent tunic for eleven days. In Pisidia, we are told that adulterers and adulteresses were paraded around the city together on a donkey. In some places in the Greek world, the punishment for adultery could be more severe, though again stopping short of death. In Locris in southern Italy, for example, a moikis could be punished by blinding. In other cities, such as Leprion and Kumai, the moikis was at risk of atimia, or the loss of civic rights. So in this episode, we talked about medical theory for pregnancy and views on women's bodies, and divorces for essentially what were childbearing reasons, either a lack of children or adultery. But we haven't talked about the actual act of childbirth itself, as well as the various rites of passages that a girl would need to go through to set herself up for marriage, and that a boy would need to accomplish to mark himself out as a future citizen soldier. That'll be the topic for two episodes down the road, because before we get there, we need to talk about Artemis, the wild goddess who protected the youths while they are making these very important transitions in their life. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, episode 76 the goddess of the young.